And what an absolute joy it is to be joined by Sarah Levy of Betterment, the CEO only since December, Sarah. You are the disruptor, of course, amid our Wealth Summit. Talk to us as a woman who was an executive, well, in, in what media, what we do, production, you were over at Viacom CBS, operations really for the media networks, but attracted to what Betterment stood for and what they were doing. Talk to us a little bit about, about why you suddenly got into fintech. Sure. Um, well, thank you, Caroline, for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I think, you know, when I first was introduced to Betterment, I met John Stein, the founder, and I was really attracted to the mission, you know, meeting John and understanding how he wanted to democratize finance, how he wanted to empower people um, to do what's best for their money, to live better. It was incredibly inspirational. And for me, that really was the heart of what I was looking for, coming from a company with, of great brands at Viacom. Um, I wanted to find a great brand that we could really, you know, help tell the story. The story has been a really good one. You've just been posting record first quarter numbers. I mean, I was looking at it and record amount of new people coming to the platform. I think there's about 56,000 more net, more money being put to work, your assets and under management continuing to increase. What are the opportunities for you right now? You really talk about it being evolution, not revolution. How are you evolving? Sure. Um, well, thank you. Yes, this first quarter has really been tremendous and, and the markets are great. And I think we were really ready to capture the moment. Um, we are right now the largest digital investment advisor um, and, you know, that our independence is part of what attracts new generations to our brand. And so when I think about kind of where we're headed, I really see two themes in this next in these next innings. The first one is around personalization. You know, we really see this generation, the millennial generation and Gen Z wanting to sort of vote with their values, um, you know, invest with their values. And so giving them an opportunity to do that is really where we're headed. Um, and then I think the second big opportunity is through our 401k Betterment for Business uh, program, where we're really kind of meeting a moment for small businesses and providing them with opportunities uh, for retirement solutions for their employees. And it's a great opportunity to educate and it's a great opportunity to bring on new, new customers. So you're for retail, you're for business, but you're also for advisors as well. Talk to us first about, about the retail, because what's so interesting is you're a storyteller and you're someone who, there's fierce competition, whichever way you look, whether it's the incumbents, we've seen Goldman Sachs with Marcus, but you're also looking at the other robo-advisors really coming to the fore, the wealth fronts of this world. How are you setting your name, your reach apart, first and foremost, for the retail investor right now? Sure. I think it's a great question. So what I love about Betterment's opportunity is we have we sit at, I think, a, the unique intersection of an established investment firm because we're a decade strong and we've got 30 billion in assets on the platform. Um, and then we bring a disruptor DNA on top and sort of sitting at the intersection of those two ideas is a unique place that we sit um, that I think affords us really great opportunity in the future. Um, uh, apologies. Don't worry. We're always used to a sing-along in the background. It's that or a dog barking. So we're, we're all in the work from home vibes. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So I think that's really our, our point of differentiation for the investor is going to be um, is going to be a combination of earning their trust and then bringing constant innovation to the platform. Of course, what's been extraordinary about the year 2020 is how much retail in particular wanted to get involved in well, putting their money to work. There was also, I mean, it became a media story, GameStop and the like, that the money you could make, but also the money and the risks that are involved. How do you think you've steadied people's nerves? What sort of distinction do you give to be able to hold a retail investor's hand through this and ensure that they're keeping their money in the market rather than sort of perhaps trading it? Yeah. Well, this COVID moment, I will tell you, has been an incredible time to enter fintech, as you might imagine. And the first thing I would say is it's really been a catalyst for um, for digital investing generally, right? So whether that's about a long-term perspective, which we have, or a shorter term, what I'll call gambling perspective, um, there was really a spotlight shown, there has been and continues to be a spotlight shown on this digital transition. And the fact that people are, you know, staying in their homes is really forcing all the generations, not just the generations who are comfortable with um, technology, but all the generations to really say, wow, there's a better way. 
And so mm -hmm. I think for us, what's been really interesting is we have steadied the nerves and whether that's with human support for our uh, clients or whether that's um, through just great technical advice, we've basically helped to explain that holding for the long term is generally um, the, the better outcome, right? A global diversified portfolio over the long term delivers better results. And so we're okay. If people want to, you know, play and have some FOMO and gamble on other platforms, that's okay. We're not going to do that. But we think that can complement you know, at the margin, we're not going to pass judgment on that. We're going to say we're a complement to that when you're thinking about setting yourself up for a long term secure future. And you talked to the top about the mission as you see the evolution of fintech enabling what you call democratization. Do you think finance is be becoming democratized, truly democratized at the moment? The fact that we're still having discussion about whether you can get in on IPOs, for example. Are you feeling that the opportunities are there for anyone to be able to start to make their way within the financial world? Look, there's there's always going to be progress to be made, but I think you know there are there are many brands now helping the unbanked and the underbanked, right? I think there's we've seen a lot of success in where you know digital disruption can really help with some of those um, groups. You know that that's not really our target audience. We do want to offer great advice to everyone, um, but I think that there are a lot of other folks going after that marketplace. Um, but there's always more progress. Uh, you know, there's always more progress we can make. And sure, you're right. You know, in places like private invest. And you know there are still sort of pockets of the market um, where you know you have to you have to be in the know. Um, but I think there's now plenty. You know the the shift to ETFs over the last mm. uh, you know several years have certainly expanded opportunities for you know low cost diversified opportunities really for the masses to participate. Um, you know in the markets. And talking about progress too, ability to put your money to work in causes that you believe in as well, the rise of ESG, largely environmental, but really now are focusing in this time of COVID, 2020 was a year of realization that social justice is incredibly important for many. And indeed, we're starting to look at governance as well. How is this an area that you're doubling down on as well, as I'm sure you are? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And um, we, so we were very early to the socially responsible investing game. Um, back in 2017, we launched our first SRI portfolios. But the beauty of kind of ESG or SRI investing, there's a lot of lingo, um, is <laughs> that it's really, it, it really does continue to change and continue to improve. And so one of the things that we did, you know, last year around the, um, you know, the tragedies with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, there was really this moment of spotlight again on racial inequity. And we have an incredibly, um, an incredible ability to move quickly off of what is a vertically integrated tech stack. And the advantage that that affords us is we can sort of, you know, spin up new ideas pretty quickly off of our platform. And so when we saw both this movement and the, you know, the climate movement, which I think is one of the great challenges of our time, we quickly introduced three brand new SRI portfolios. And they've had incredible momentum, both because I think they're meeting the moment, and again, because these next generations who are just coming into some wealth really do want to vote with their values and want to be more active than previous generations. And I think that's really a place we can differentiate differentiate ourselves. And we've seen really incredible adoption. And we just continue to find the best possible products to put into those portfolios. It's almost interesting, the year of 2020, whether it be health or then whether it became justice, whether it became, you know, a health crisis to an economic crisis, a social crisis, all of it really was a moment to tackle inequality. And it looks also like this is a real focus in the new administration trying to look at wealth inequality and the distribution thereof. There are new and more and more tax pro proposals coming in from the Biden administration that I'm sure has many of your retail clients thinking, but also on the business side of yours as well and the advisory side of yours. How are you looking at the landscape changing, whether it be, of course, we at Bloomberg, everyone's focusing on changes, perhaps capital gains tax, but there's also inheritance tax. Is that something that you, you're you fielding questions on more and more within the business? So again, really, really good question. I mean, I think as it relates specifically to, to Biden's um, you know, tax proposals, those are still pretty early. So I think we're going to have to wait and see kind of where the dust settles there. But when we think about tax, again, talk about shining a spotlight on something where we're prepared to sort of meet the moment, right? Tax 
uh, tax efficient inv investing is one of the things that technology does so incredibly well. So, you know, tax loss harvesting has been one of the one of the ways where our investors really do get a better outcome over time. And so I think as we think about taxes becoming, you know, potentially raising, our tools are an incredible solution to that. And we have a team of experts who are there and ready on the phones to support clients mm. kind of through that journey. So I think it's, a, again, it's a combination for us as, as with the overall business between the technology solutions and sort of the human uh, expertise that can bring advice for the client. And I think we'll have to do that more and more as people are you know, wondering about their tax bills. Interesting. Is that human touch, sort of the way you're distinguishing yourselves from other quote unquote robo advisors is that well, you're not just robo. I think it's definitely a point of differentiation for us. And, you know, you hit at the top that we also have this business for advisors and we're a SaaS solution for advisors. And one of the reasons for that is that we really believe that we need to meet investors wherever they're comfortable. And so some investors are having their first investment experience via their employer, via their 401k. So Betterment is there to meet them, you know, at their job at, with their first retirement account. If somebody's more comfortable with an advisor, they can be on the Betterment platform via an advisor providing advice to them. And I really do believe that while there are people for whom um, a robo solution is enough, there are others who need a human touch. And I think that that will differentiate us. Um, you know, it's it's a page we took from the incumbents, but I think it's something that will it will differentiate us relative to some of the challengers. Of course, Sarah, we both sit here rather obviously as women. And I think that there's was an interesting narrative on at the end of last week that Robin Hood was really trying to focus in on how many more women were getting into the cryptocurrency space via them or they were getting into investing their own money generally or putting money to work in stocks via Robin Hood. Are you seeing, how do you target women, for example, first time investors there? Is that something that you've seen a real element of demand or surge of demand or is that not something you're distinguishing on? Well, it's interesting because connecting to your prior point around SRI investing, one of the things we're seeing in the SRI portfolios is we're seeing um, many more women than our average customer because our customers are, you know, just slightly more than half are men at the moment, um, which I think is not surprising in investing. Um, so that's one thing that the SRI portfolios are really bringing in women. And we're also seeing really interesting investing dynamics with women. Um, they're, you know, they're trusting, they're brand loyal, um, they stay with you. And so I think there really is an incredible opportunity because women think about finances differently. And so I think, you know, the beauty of a technical solution is you can serve multiple audiences. And so as we think about personalization more broadly, um, there's a real opportunity there um, to speak differently to different audiences about what they what they care about. Talking about audiences, that in fact was a question for the audience, which I should have pointed out yeah. before. And keep them coming, audience, because we want your we want your viewpoints here. And I, I'm interested in I mentioned there sort of crypto for a beat. And I mean, is that something that you're looking at at Betterment? Because it feels like the whole world is suddenly trying to unveil that it can give you access to one, one crypto or the other. It does. You know, I think we're in early innings on crypto, clearly. Um, and I, we're doing our research, right? We're talking to customers. I think, you know, we're believers that if we can provide the right kind of context and advice, um, that it's okay to participate in some of these newer asset classes. And so I'd like us to find a way to responsibly offer crypto, but I can't say that we're there yet. I think we're still in kind of watch and learn mode right now. Going, it's interesting with crypto, you're getting more and more institutional players coming in. And let's go back to your sort of institutional part of the business, or indeed your advisory part of the business. How, how are you setting yourself apart there? What was what got you into that part to want to compete on that level? And and what is it that advisors are coming to you wanting to build? Sure. So I think you know the original um, catalyst for getting into the the advisor space was really about just solving pretty simple kind of back office problems as only a technical solution can, right? And so um, so we just felt like we could provide something that was delightful both for the end user and for the advisor, and that's how we initially got into the business. Um, as we've progressed, most recently, you know the biggest request from our advisors has been custom portfolio creation, and so we launched mm -hmm. earlier this year the ability 
opportunity for advisors to, um, to, to create their own portfolios, which was an important part of what the value they deliver to their customers, while we continue to iterate on the platform and kind of take care of all that paperwork for them. Um, the interesting thing and the connectivity for me with the advisor business is really you see it as kind of the tip of the spear, which is to say advisors bring us information on what customers want, who maybe are a little wealthier or a little further along in their investment journey than our core retail customer. And so what we do there is we can test and we can learn and we can you know, introduce things via advisors. And when they work, we have an easy ability to then adopt those, um, you know, those techniques and the, those elements, uh, features for our, for our retail customers. So that's one of the more interesting reasons to stay in that business. And of course, your retail business, you were saying, look, you can go elsewhere if you want to be speculative. But are you trying to introduce that ability or looking at that ability to, you know, if you're, you've got a female investor who's very keen on being in your ESG funds, but every now and then wants to get into a single name stock, how do you offer that as a solution? Yeah, look, I never say never, but I, I don't I don't see in our immediate roadmap any plans for, for example, single stock trading. But I think the opportunity to hold single stocks within the context of a diversified portfolio is something that we need to be thinking about. And I think you can imagine seeing us move a little more in that direction in the in the coming uh, quarters. What about also moving in the coming quarters towards, well, your own stock being available to your retail investor. Would would you, I know, of course, John Stein, when he handed over the reins, becoming chairman, you getting the, the role of chief executive, there is talk of an IPO, of listing. Is that still something you're looking at? Mostly that talk is with the media, but, um, <laughs> but I think, yes, you know, People love that question. Certainly, I think you know it, there there is an opportunity for this to be one of the great financial brands of the future. And I think when we're ready, certainly an IPO is kind of in our sights. But right now, my primary focus is growth, and I think we have just mm -hmm. an incredible story to tell. So I'm I'm kind of not not thinking down the road there yet. I'm really focused on how do we grow this business and how do we become the best brand we can possibly be for the customers. And let's talk about, therefore, that growth and the brand that you become, because I thought it was so interesting that really the founder, John, went out there and said, I don't want someone from finance to lead this business as chief executive. I want someone outside of finance because they can disrupt better. How do you think that you specifically, with your background in media and storytelling, are able to disrupt in a way that perhaps someone in finance couldn't? Sure. Well, I think you know, brand building has is really a part of my personal DNA, right? I spent I spent nearly two decades at Nickelodeon, um, you know, one of the great kids brands uh, of all time, and then and then worked at Viacom on a collection of brands, and so I built a career understanding sort of the research and the you know niche audiences and how you tell stories for those audiences. So I think that's a really applicable idea. And then mm -hmm. the second thing I did is I built big global multifaceted operations. And so when John was ready to step down, he really said, you know, I'm looking for someone who can take this business kind of to the next level from a scale perspective, which is something he hadn't done. He's an incredible innovator. Um, but, you know, he hadn't made that leap to a big company. So I think between operations and branding, those are really the two things he saw in me as complementary opportunities for this kind of next wave of our growth. And talking of scale, of course, what was it back in March, you announced the purchase of Wealth Simple's US book of business. Is M&A part of that growth story, do you think? I think it is. You know, I think we're going to be selective, um, but there's a lot of incredible innovation going going on around us. And, you know, I, I don't want to be so arrogant as to think that we're going to come up with all the innovation ourselves. I think M&A can be a fantastic way to accelerate growth, to find new functionality, to bring great people into the company. You know, there are exciting entrepreneurs out there and we want Betterment to be a place that people want to work. And so I think, you know, M&A can be a great way to find those kind of exciting stories and we don't want to miss them. And when when we're looking now at sort of the year of 2021, we hope a year in which we continue on this reopening story and then we don't take backward steps and, and, and then indeed COVID will be something that we can eventually put in the rearview mirror for a time and get back to some sort of normality. But, but normal isn't going to be the normal we had in 2019. And how do you see that as an opportunity for you as you build a culture within Betterment, as you build a brand as well? How has it changed you and how are you thinking about your employees and your, and your other, of course, stakeholders out there? Yeah, well, I think... 
you know, I think that happy employees and a, and a culture that people want to be a part of has been part of um, Betterment's DNA. And that's something that John built, and that's something I want to build on. And I think that this new sort of work at home, you know, dog barking in the back kind of um, situation is really um, gives us an opportunity. It gives us an opportunity to adapt, you know, back to your question about women, right? Women workers who want to have a little bit something a little bit more flexible, not just women, people who are caregivers for the older generations. So, you know, as I think about it, I think we certainly want to have folks in the office to build that culture, but we want to provide that flexibility. And I think we're going to have a little more distributed workforce as a result, which means we can access talent wherever they want to live. So I think it's I a great opportunity.